Hey Amen. I, I don't want to put her on the spot or nothing, but I know that she used to testify, but I could tell the Spirit of the Lord really moving on Sister June this morning as we were doing this song, and oh, yeah. uh, I want her to testify this morning for the Lord. You know, I just uh, thank the Lord this morning, and I thank you for that Spirit that did move me right. here. Amen. When we began to sing this song, and you know, there's coming a day there'll be no crying, there'll be no pain, there'll be no heartache. All the former things are going to be washed away. And you know, I was also thinking about a song that says, I'm going to take a vacation. You know, this time of the year, people are out for different reasons, and they go on vacations, different places, and there's nothing wrong with that. But there's coming a day. I'm going to take a vacation, and I won't be coming back. And I'm going to go to a city where I'm going to swim in the river of life, and I'm going to sit down by that river and see that river flow by. There'll never be another heartache. There'll never be another pain. There'll never be another trial. And the more we live down here, the more trials and heartaches that we see, that lets us know that there's coming a day that all of that's going to be washed away. And the Bible said when you see all these things happening, that we see happening nowadays that's bringing sorrow to our fleshly mind. Look up for your redemption draweth nigh. We ought to be as Christians proud to see the things that's taking place. Because I'm telling you, this thing's winding up and things are beginning to fall in place. If you look at the Word of God, it's lining up. And there's coming a time that there's going to be a shout. And the saints of God are going to rise. But we're not going to go before them that's already gone. Because the Bible said they're going to rise first. Then we're going and together be with the Lord. Thank the Lord this morning for His spirit. Hallelujah.
us forward this morning. Let's pray for Brother Ray as he comes uh, oh, to preach to us. Oh, yes. Lord, we thank you this morning. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. We praise you this morning, Jesus. Amen. I'm so glad you're in the house of the Lord. Good morning, Independent. Hey, that sounds pretty good. I said good morning, Independent. I like excitement. I like excitement, praise the Lord. The right kind of excitement. Let me make myself clear. Joy cometh in the morning. I'm telling you, uh, how many was here Wednesday night and we had a, I thought we had a great service, but I, I was telling you about Gideon Strip coming back home, and so glad to have him with us this morning. Got a lot back here uh, visiting with us today. Hope y'all just come all the time. Really not visitors. They just come here and there, you know, and we just count them home folks. So I told you I couldn't wait for him to get his first check so I could borrow $500 from him. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, guess what? I got it. Now, mamas and daddies, you know how that works. You know how that works? Anybody? You know, you give them money, you, you usually don't see it back. Now, getting he'd get money from his mom, it was gone. But if I had money and I let him borrow it, I'd say, I want that back. And he always brought it back. You know what? He'll be expecting it back from me. Hallelujah. But I tell you what, I appreciate him getting home safely, and I appreciate all of you being in the house of the Lord this morning. There was a man asked what the color of his pastor's eyes were. And he said, I don't know. I have no idea. He said, whenever he prays, he closes his eyes, and when he preaches, I close mine. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> so he didn't have any idea. But turn with me this morning to St. Matthew's Gospel for a few moments, if you would. Pray for us, the Lord would just have his way this morning. Matthew chapter number 14. I just want to read verse 6, a few, a few verses down. Matthew chapter 14, verse number 6. When Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them, and it pleased him. Now you can read between the lines there if you want to. Uh, there was something going on. There was a vibration there. There was a feeling taking place. And verse 7 said, whereupon he promised her, I'm telling you there was something happening because he promised her in verse 7 with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask, anything, that's what he said. And you know what she said in verse 8? Being before instructed by her mother, mothers, instruct your daughters, don't instruct them this way. She said, give me here John the Baptist's head in a charger. Bring it to me on a platter. I want his head on a platter. And the king, the Bible says in verse number 9, was sorry. The king was sorry. Nevertheless, for the oath's sake, and them which sat with him at meat, he commanded it to be given her. Father, we thank you this morning for your grace and your mercy, and we're asking you now, Lord, to be our helper and our God moves through the power and the anointing of your word. And for that, we'll give you all the praise, honor, and glory. In the name of Jesus, the church said amen and amen. If the Lord would help us for a few moments this morning, I would like to preach to us on the king was sorry in the demise of a conscience. And the king was sorry the demise of a conscience. When you begin to look at this story here in St. Matthew's Gospel, it's a tragic story. It's a sad story. And believe it or not, in one way or another, we see these same stories 
running and taking place even in the hour that we live in today. Maybe not on the same level, but spiritually on the same level and even more. John the Baptist is murdered by this king by the name of Herod Antipas in cold blood. Murdered in cold blood. And, and Jesus said that John was the greatest man to be born by natural means. If you turn over to Luke, he said, For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. He said he was a great man. But worse than murdering a good man, you follow me and help me today, church. But worse than murdering a good man is murdering, hear me today, your own conscience. And this is what happened when you look into the life of Herod. That's exactly what Herod did when he ruled out that conscience and had that head brought to her on a platter. Now there may be some here today, if you're not careful, that may be treading dangerously in your own lives, uh, uh, treading close to doing the exact same thing uh, that Herod did here. Uh, but let's add another character into the story uh, this morning. We look at the king's wife uh, uh, Herodias and, and you can equate her into these and, and you can look at others Herod and Herodias uh, and John the, uh, the, the Baptist and, and to three of the famous people that we know about in the Old Testament we can liken them under them and you remember King Ahab and Jezebel and the prophet Elijah and you have a, a wicked king and a, a she devil don't you look over at your wife sitting next to you hallelujah if you're married this morning amen a uh, she devil wife and a bold prophet of God amen the same thing uh, taking place before them uh, the Herod family if you look at them and examine their their history comes uh, on the scene in a, a, a big way in your New Testament first of all there was Herod the Great we all have heard of him who had at least nine wives uh, uh, too bad they didn't have nine lives praise God because he thought nothing hear me today he thought nothing of them and of his own children and if they got in his way guess what he had them slaughtered just like he did amen John the Baptist if anything got in his way that's just the, the way it was he took them out he's the one that slayed all of the infants in Bethlehem at the time of Christ's birth hear me today then there's his son Herod and that we're looking at this morning. His title was Herod, the Tetrarch, which means the ruler over a fourth of the kingdom. He was a big will, in other words. He was well known for living large. You know anybody living large this morning? Living large. A lot of folks trying to live large is not able. Get in trouble. That's a message in itself today. Praise God. But he was one... He had the means. He had the material possessions. He was able to live large at the cost of others. And, and Jesus said over in Mark chapter 8, verse 15, he warned of the dangers of the, the leaven of Herod. We've heard it said, the leaven, uh, amen, uh, which I believe to be nothing more than materialism and fleshly appetites. If you look in the scripture, leaven is, is most of the time uh, a symbol of evil. It's especially that uh, doctrine or teaching that's false, uh, evil teaching. And the leaven of Herod refers simply to the philosophy of the Herodians that uh, was being taught during this time. That's what I think. That's what I want. That's what I want, uh, the ideas that I have in my mind for you, the way that you should live. And Jesus was warning them of this way of living. Herod was a drunken, depraved man. And his son was Herod Agrippa. He was the one that imprisoned Peter and he killed James. And his son was Herod Agrippa II. They loved that name. It meant something in that time. People were afraid of them. I'm trying to get somewhere with this. It was a wicked family that they were afraid of. It, it was like a, a, maybe the the mafia in Chicago or some of those others back in the earlier parts of the first or first century mafia likened to what we had in the early 20th century. 
I'll get it out in a minute. But let's get back to Matthew 14. Jesus called him a fox. Anytime somebody is called a fox, you better look out. We got a lot of foxes in the hour where we live in. Hear me this morning. Watch out who you associate with, or they may be a fox. Hallelujah. And you can tell that uh, Herod is recounting what has happened as you read this story in his mind. What has taken place from the past and how that he had killed John. And now, at this time, he's, he's, he's beginning to realize that he's messed up. His conscience is, is guilty and it's beginning to, to, to bother him. He's killed no telling how many people. Had him killed at the snap of a finger. But now, here was John the Baptist that Jesus spoke and said was the greatest man ever to be born to woman. You can't tell me when you do something like that that the Spirit of God is not going to move in your heart. Every human being today is born with a conscience. And we may not need to get reacquainted with some of the things that people haven't spoken in a long time. We, we may want to leave that alone. A, a conscience is hard to uh, define. It's hard to explain some of the things that can take place in a conscience. There was a little boy who said, your conscience is what makes you tell your mom what you did wrong before your little sister does. Conscience is a serious thing this morning, church. What's the difference, you say, between the words conscience and conscious? Conscious is when you are aware, and conscience is when you wish that you weren't. When you wish that you weren't. Conscience is that that red warning light that is flashing in your soul, giving you that signal that something just isn't right. Amen. It's a, it's a moral beeper that goes off when you've done something that's not right. When you've done something that's wrong, that, that beeper begins to beep. Beep, 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 beep. There's an old Indian uh, word picture, and it's the conscience is this square peg inside of the heart that, that turns whenever you do something wrong. And as it turns, the square peg, the, the sharp edges give it you the, uh, the sensation that you need to quit. It, there's a pain. You need to stop. It's, it's getting your attention. There's something wrong. And if you ignore these warning times over and over, these signals over and over again, if you ignore them, those edges after a while, begin to wear off. Are you hearing me this morning? And before long, it can just turn freely and just continue to turn without you feeling anything anymore. At the beginning, it hurts. And at the beginning, there's pain. But after that peg begins to turn for a while and grinds on your heart, my friend, uh, you get to the place where you feel nothing. Uh, I'm telling you today, we have men and women uh, that are walking throughout this land. Uh, that square peg uh, has twisted and grinded uh, in their hearts. Uh, I'm telling you, the Spirit of the Lord uh, has tried to get their attention uh, all across this land, uh, this nation. Uh, of this world that we're living in. Amen. God is trying to get people's attention. He's trying to warn them. He's doing everything that he can to say, hey, I want you to realize I'm trying to show you some love. I'm trying to show you some love. Quit pushing it away. Quit fighting it. Quit allowing it to go on like it never happened. Do something about it. Pain is a friend to us. You say amen? amen? I said pain is a friend. God gave us pain. We, we don't like it. I didn't say we like it, but it's a friend to us. Why is it a friend to us? Because it lets you know whenever something's not right. When you begin to hurt in your body, those nerves and those sensors, I know they got all kind of fancy names, but they begin to hurt. And it lets us know that there's something not right in our bodies. So what do we do? The first thing we do is we call 
We ought to be calling God, but we, we, most of us would get on the phone and call the doctor. Huh? And, and try to get something done for that pain. That's something God gave us for good. But if this pain is our friend, we need to understand that when it's dealing with our conscience and not a physical problem, that we need to be careful and we need to understand that there's many a man today, church, that are allowing their consciences to be dulled day after day after day after day. Romans chapter 2, verse 15 says, which show the work of the law written in the hearts of their conscience, also bearing witness. It bears witness within the hearts of of man. Amen. Those that have been taught the law, those that have been taught what's right and wrong, amen. Conscience, the Bible says, bears witness within us. And their thoughts, he says, uh, the thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else accusing one another. Romans 2.15. In other words, he's saying they're keeping the laws of God by nature. Amen. It proves that they have the law that is written down in their hearts and the conscience bears witness of obedience or it condemns one when they're disobedient it is proving that God has not left his people without a light Vanessa was talking about that this morning in Sunday school it's showing us that God has has given us something amen amen a, a light to justify or either to condemn us in judgment what are you going to do with your conscience in other words how are you going to react when your conscience begins to work on you? I may have shared this story about the IRS before. I can't remember, but I actually got online and I looked this up to see if this was a fact. And sure enough, it was. I can't imagine it, but it's there. The IRS has what's called a conscience fund. Anybody ever heard of that? And it was started all the way back in 1811. Someone in New York City sent in six dollars because they had cheated on their taxes felt guilty the conscience bothered them see they wanted to get that off their conscience in 1950 a few years later three hundred and seventy thousand dollars was turned in fourteen thousand dollars was sent in by one person and they've received notes from different various people that say such things as I'll sleep better now see man one note said, I'd hate to burn in hell over a couple hundred bucks. Hmm? And one of the favorite ones here says, I'm sending you this $170 because my conscience is bothering me. If it continues to bother me, I'll send the rest. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's the way some people think. Amen. Amen. I'll do a little something about it. I'll try to get a, do a little something here or there and try to get this off of me. But I'm going to tell you something until it's all under the blood. Until it's been taken care of. Until the blood of Jesus has been applied to your heart and to your life. It's still going to bother you. David, when he sinned, I know I like to use David, but when he sinned, uh, it cost a man his life and no telling how many of the lives it cost in the long run that we, not, we don't even realize. We know his child lost his life because of the sin that he had committed. But when David committed that sin, he was a man after God's own heart. You cannot tell me that there was a conscience that was working on the inside of him. Amen. What is sin? We talked about it this morning. Amen. It is when we uh, commit a offense against God. It's when we, Sister Phyllis, missed the mark. I'm telling you, I missed the mark when I came into this life. I was born as an offense to God because of the endemic nature of my life, because of the sin of Adam. There's not a one of us this morning, I'm telling you, that is not in need of a Savior. We're in need of a Savior this morning. You want to know why you have some of the problem that you have today it's because you don't have things made up right between you and God and God saying to you it's time to make them right hallelujah 
It's time to lay it on an altar. You've been running for a long time. It's time to lay it on the altar and make it right. Don't ignore your conscience when your conscience is working on you. Don't ignore that. It, it can destroy you. Your conscience can be dull to the point where you don't even feel. Don't say it can't happen. I know people like that. The world says, let your conscience, what? Be your guide. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? And it is for the most part. Let your conscience be your guide. But it's not always a good idea. Well, why are you saying that, Brother Ray? Because you can't always do that because conscience doesn't set the standard of right and wrong. You got that? It's conscience is not what sets the standard of right and wrong. It only applies to the standards that you have been what? Taught. If you've never been taught something, if you have never known something, and, and you're doing it, well, your conscience is not going to bother you because you know nothing about it. But I'll tell you what, most of us live or are from the good old, what we call it, the Bible Belt. I'm talking about folks that ain't even been brought up in church knows a lot of what's right and wrong. Amen? But we can learn a lot from this passage of Scripture right here that I'm reading to us this morning where John the Baptist lost his life. And we can learn from Herod and his conscience. Herod's conscience was troubled. It was troubled because, first of all, the message of God that he received. It was troubled because of the man of God that delivered the message to him. He didn't like it. His wife, sure enough, didn't like it. He felt guilty, not only for taking the life of John, but for what John had said to him earlier. And he knew what the, the man of God was saying to him was true. He knew it was true. He was guilty of gross immorality. I'm telling you today, we're living in the land, and we're living in an hour. I know we don't want to hear it, but there's such gross immorality all around us, and people are just flaunting themselves all around, doing all of these ungodly acts of evil, and it never crosses their mind not one time of the consequence to be paid for those acts of immorality. It's going to be a payday someday. He knew it. Herod knew it. He knew it. He knew it because it was working on him. I promise you, he realized it was on a, a trip to Rome that he had become infatuated with his brother's wife. His brother's wife, for crying out loud. He divorced his own wife and he took her from his brother. What an act of love. I love you, brother. I love you. But I'm going to take your wife. Oh, she looks good. And I got to have her. Huh? That's what he did. But now, the man of God has pointed him out. I'm telling you, people get away with some of the things that they get away with because we have so many weak need pastors and so many weak need ministers and teachers and laity that will not say what thus saith the Lord. <laughs> Amen. And that's why we have some of the things going on in our churches that we have going on. That's another sermon. We don't have time for that. But he told him just like it was. He didn't cut him any slack. He had coveted, John uh, uh, told him that he had coveted his neighbor's wife and had committed adultery. And John, I'm telling you, the Baptist did not cut him any slack whenever he was preaching. Not even for the king, I'm telling you. And we shouldn't do it either. We shouldn't cut any slack either when it comes to what thus saith the Lord our God. The word of God should go forth just as it is. I'm not talking about trying to hurt somebody. You know, I'm talking about bringing it with love and kindness and compassion and doing what you can to make a difference. I'm not talking about just trying to hurt someone. That's not what I'm out to do. That's not what I'm about. If I can, if I can get you to see 
the error of your ways. If I can get you to understand that there's a Savior. If I can get you to see that, that portrait of Him <laughs> making His way up to Calvary and get you to see the blood that He shed when He was a sinless, sinless individual. A place where we should have been and He paid the price. If I can get you to see him go into the grave. If I can get you to see him coming up on the third day. If I can get you to understand that he went away. That he could send the comforter. That he went away so that he could send the Holy Ghost. To be in our midst. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Not only did he have a troubled mind he had a troubled conscience Herod his conscience was was trapped if you please let me read that sixth verse again I'm gonna hurry I'm gonna hurry but when Herod's birthday the Bible says was kept his, uh, the daughter Herod Rodius danced before them and pleased Herod we already mentioned that it it did something for him. No telling how she was dancing. I'm sure it was in some type of lewd manner for him to be willing to give up half of his kingdom, give her whatever she wanted. But the Bible says, whereupon he promised and gave an oath whatsoever she would ask. Verse 9 says, and the king was sorry. You know what? He realized. He realized it, but because of him, him his, his status, let me just stop right there for a moment. Because of his status, he wanted to prove a point that he couldn't back up. I'm the king. I, I know I'm not doing right. I'm not supposed to do this, but what are my buddies going to think about me? What are my friends going to think? I know that this is not right, but what are my friends going to say about this? So I've got to go ahead on and do it anyway to show face. That's what he did. That's exactly what he did. The Bible says he was sorry. Sin's like a spider that weaves this web of guilt. One strand at a time. If I had time this morning, I'd show you. You've probably seen it done. You take a, just one thread and wrap it around an individual's arm and or two maybe, and you tell them to break that piece of thread and they break right out of it with no problem wrong. They break right out of it. But you take that, that same little thread that they put in these shirts and these pants and you take that whole spool and you wrap it around a person's arms and continue to wrap it. I'm telling you, when it gets time for them to break forth, they're bound up. They're bound. And that's the way it works in our minds and in our hearts. When that spider... Weaves that web of guilt one strand at a time. Oh, what a tangled web that we're weaved into. And, and Herod was still doing wrong. Now he was lusting after Herodias' daughter and he steps into this trap. It was set for him. She knew what she was doing. 1 John 2.16, the lust of the flesh, the eyes, the pride of life. We've heard that before, haven't we? They're not of the Father, the Bible says, but they're of the what? The world. These things are of the world. And he goes on to say, if you want to read it, that the world is going to pass away. Go ahead and follow after the things of the world. Make the things of the world your number one priority. The world's going to pass away, friend. The world is going to leave us. And he steps into this trap. And his passions leads to pride and he's trapped by his own pride. And he's got to keep this promise now that he's made uh, uh, to her. And Proverbs chapter 29 verse 25 says, The fear of man bringeth a snare. But whosoever putteth his trust in the Lord, anybody know what it says? Shall be safe. Shall be safe. Look over to somebody sitting next to you and say, I want to be safe. Come on, look over and say, I want to be safe. Hallelujah. I don't want to be trapped. I want to be safe. 
When I leave this old world, when they roll my body down before, amen, this pulpit or whatever pulpit, if I even get to go to a pulpit, we might just be caught up out of here, sister. Woo! But I'm telling you, whenever I get pushed up here, I want it to have been said that I died and I was not in a trap. But I did the best that I could, and I died with a clear conscience. Woo! I died with a clear conscience. Hallelujah. I know i got to hurry. Dr. H.A. Arnside wrote many commentaries, books, was lost as a teenager. And his mom would beg him to be saved. She'd plead with him time and time again, son, give your heart to God. And he'd say, what's my friends going to think? What's my friends going to say? That's what Herod was thinking in the back of his mind. He had to keep his deal. He had to keep the oath that he made. And he later recalls that he got saved when he realized the truth in his mother's reply as she spoke to him. She said, Harry, your friends can laugh you into hell. They can't laugh you out. Huh? They can laugh you into hell, but they can't laugh you out. He had a troubled conscience. His, his conscience was trapped. And there's no turning back now. His conscience is trapped. And he's on this slippery slope. And now, Herod's conscience is being tormented. It's being tormented. Now, just hearing about Jesus coming forth and doing the miracles that he was doing, and, and if you read the Bible, you understand they were wondering who he was. Some said he's the, 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 uh, Elias. Some said he's a prophet. <laughs> what did Herod say? No, it's not. That's John the Baptist. He's done come back from the dead. And the funny thing about it is John the Baptist, I mean, a, a Herod would have been a Sadducee, and remember, the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. That's why they're sad, you see. But you can read it. He said, no, it's John the Baptist. He's come back. That wrong that he had done, that, that sin that he had committed, it was working in his mind. It was touching him all the time. He couldn't get away from it no matter how hard he tried. And the very moment that he heard that, that popped up. And, oh, it's John. It's John. It's John. Hallelujah. We make bold statements. It's interesting, too, how at times in our lives when we get desperate, we can... We kind of just melt away with bad theology. We make all these bold statements about what we believe and the things that we don't believe in life. But when we hit the very bottom in life and truth comes to life, truth comes to surface, there's no atheist, you ever heard the saying, in a pop zone? Huh? <laughs> No reality. Reality comes crashing in. There's many of people that they want a religion that's good enough to live by. But when it comes time to lay this whole body down, when you're facing death, church, you realize that you need a belief that's not only good enough to live by, that one that's good to die by. And while that conscience is trying to get a hold of you, I'm begging you this morning, before you allow that square peg to, to be rounded off until the edges are gone and you run for so long that you become accustomed to the Spirit of the Lord trying to move in your heart and your life, I'm begging you this morning to realize that God loves you. He's trying to help you. And He's throwing out a lifeline this morning to rescue you in your need today. Hallelujah. 
Christians having money troubles all of a sudden think back to how they done some of the things they did with God and their money when they didn't obey God. Some people realize how that they've done wrongs in their lives. And now some of the things they've done is beginning to affect their marriage and affect their home and affect their, their children and their lives. We can do some things in our own lives. We don't think a whole lot about it, but when we look and see our children doing those same things, then it starts to get a hold of our hearts, or it should. It should, it should. Stand with us. Father, we thank you this morning. Oh, for the sweet Holy Ghost. We thank you this morning for the conscience that you placed with inside of each one of our hearts. But for more than anything, the Spirit of the Lord that lives with inside of us. That gentle prick that lets us know when we've done wrong, when we sin. Thank this morning, Lord. Lord, don't let me get to the place in my life to where those things don't bother me any longer. Don't let me get to the place that when I've sinned, that I can just go on living like it's never happened. Lord, continue to work in my heart and remind me each day how infallible I am. Hallelujah. Oh, God, how short I come up before you in this life. And I'm asking you to help me this morning in Jesus' name. Could we find us an altar this morning? You need a relationship with the Lord today. Come on, church, let's come and pray. Amen. Are you here and you need a relationship with the Lord? Are you here and your conscience has been working on you? You can get that situation.